Richard, you're working on an exhibit about sharks for a, the, a museum in Florida. Could you tell me a little bit about that? First of all, it's an art museum, mm -hmm. and the idea is to use sharks as representative elements of our own culture, whether it's painting, sculpture, posters, movies, books, personal experiences, whatever it is, we are working that into the exhibit because I believe, and I'm hoping to be able to communicate, that sharks play much greater role in our lives than most people are prepared to recognize. Most people tend to think of them as, you know, jaws-like creatures that are off somewhere in the ocean. I don't, I'm afraid to go in the water. That's the end of it. But they are so much a part of the way we think. They're so much a part of our own culture. And this is what I'm trying to do with this exhibit. I'm trying to raise the consciousness of people and make sure that their consciousness is not only, oh dear, I'm not going in the water because there's something in there that's going to bite me. Excellent. So what sort of items are going to be in this exhibit? At first, I thought of only doing paintings, and there's Winslow Homer's famous Gulf Stream, which is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. There's John Singleton Copley's painting called Watson and the Shark, which shows a naked man, who turns out to have been Watson, who fell into the water in Havana Harbor, and he was attacked by a shark. This is a true story. He was attacked by a shark, and his leg was bitten off. It was painted, the scene was painted long after it happened, by an American painter called John Singleton Copley. There are three versions of that. One is in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, one is in the Detroit Institute of Fine Arts, and the other is in the Boston Museum of Art. We're getting the one that's in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's going to be, we're not getting the Gulf Stream, they're not releasing that famous Winslow Homer painting, but we're gonna use a reproduction of it. Um, and the other shark painter that I thought about at first, of course, was me. But I thought, this isn't very many painters. So then I began to find sculptors, I began to find other painters, I began to find posters, I began to find a whole lot of images that were suitable for an art museum. And the art museum is the chosen venue specifically because the things are part of our culture. I've worked in this museum for a very long time here in New York at the Museum of Natural History. And it is, in a sense, and I don't mean to demean my favorite museum, which is the one I work in, but in fact, this museum removes the subject matter from our culture. This is an experience that you go to with your kids but it doesn't resonate. The whales, the tigers, the lions, the fossils, none of that is part of our daily lives. Whereas an art museum means more to human beings culturally than a natural history museum. And that's the reason this is gonna be in an art museum. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that there would, be, there would be items other than paintings and sculptures. What? What sort of artwork can portray the importance of sharks to our daily lives? It depends on where you are, but sharks are, were part of the daily lives of a lot of native peoples. For example, Polynesians used to make weapons out of koa wood, and they would embed shark's teeth in the outside of the weapon. It's hard to imagine a more dangerous artifact than an item that's lined with shark's tooth, shark's teeth points out. There are ceremonies, part of Northwest Coast Indians, where there were shark clans, and these are masks that were made by native carvers to symbolize sharks, and we're gonna put some of those in the exhibit. We're gonna put whatever, and there's a, a in the uh, Solomon Islands in the Pacific, they made a lot of little wood carvings of sharks and they put little real shark's teeth in them. We're getting a lot of those. In other words, what we're trying, what I'm trying to accomplish here is I'm trying to get as much representative depictions, many representative depictions of sharks by anybody anywhere. Japanese prints, American paintings, South Sea Island carvings, weapons, and then posters, sculpture, paintings. I'm putting a 50-foot balloon 
on the top of the museum, a megalodon balloon that will attract people to, you see it from the road, it will attract people to the museum. I hope they don't drive off the road when they see it, but they'll say, oh, I wonder what that is, we'll go look. My whole idea about this exhibit is because it is so pertinent, because sharks mean so much, even though a lot of people don't recognize it, but sharks mean so much that if the exhibit is done well enough, I am hoping that people will go to the exhibit, go home and tell somebody else about it. The, my goal in this exhibit is to have somebody go through the exhibit and say, wow, I didn't know that. That's terrific. And I want people to go to this exhibit, and then I want them to come back, go to it again, and again, and again, and again. It's going to be that kind of exhibit. Most exhibits in most museums, whether they're natural history or art museums, aren't like that. You say, OK, I've seen the paintings. I've seen the sculpture. I've seen the dinosaurs. You don't feel that I have to go back tomorrow to see the dinosaurs again. I am hoping to be able to accomplish exactly that in this shark exhibit, to say, wow, this is sensational. You have to see this. There'll be movies, there'll be videos, there'll be shark cages, there'll be lectures if I can coerce these people to come over from Australia or South Africa and give lectures. It's going to be completely interactive. And the other thing, of course, is I'm going to try and have an ongoing current events blog, if you will, saying this is what just happened. Somebody was just attacked. Uh, they've just passed a law protecting sharks or 100 million sharks are killed every year. Whatever it is, I want people to recognize that sharks are part of their daily lives. How can people find out more about this exhibit? When, it, when is this going to be open? It's going to open in uh, May of 2012 and run until October of 2012. We are trying to travel the whole exhibit, pack it all up and send it other places. I'm, I'm sure I'm going to be teased for uh, asking about a marine mammal question in, while standing in front of the shark exhibit here, but behind me here is one of the more iconic exhibits at the American Museum of Natural History, the giant blue whale. And you were involved in the construction of this model, weren't you? I was actually involved in the, the design of it. I was a newly minted exhibit designer here at the American Museum of Natural History. And I sat at my little big drawing table, and they said, OK, son, I was younger, they said, OK, son, you've got to figure out what this whale is supposed to look like. I said, what whale? They said, we're going to put a blue whale in this giant room. So I said, OK, and I began to do the research on blue whales, finding, to my surprise, that there were no good images of blue whales. This is, after all, the largest animal that's ever lived. And it's alive. It's alive today. No, there were no photographs of any whales underwater, let alone blue whales. So I did a lot of research, kind of figured out what it was going to look like, did the drawings of what this whale actually looks like, and then supervised the construction of it. It was made by a company in Georgia, the name of which escapes me. Um, it was made here on the spot. There are eye beams inside the whale covered in styrofoam, carved styrofoam, and then covered in fiberglass. This object weighs 15 tons. Um, but it is, as I say, the iconic exhibit here at the Natural History Museum, and one that I'm afraid people are going to put on my tombstone. It's going to say, he designed the whale. I would rather they said he wrote the book about the giant squid or the tuna or the polar bear or something, but no question about it, he designed the whale.